Oh, well, it's fantastic to be here. So, if I could have my slides up on the screen. I'm going to start with a huge challenge and then move on to solutions and paradigm shifts. This is the task ahead of us. This is what we need to do to meet a target of no more than 1.5 degrees C of warming. This requires a level of change that is completely unprecedented in human history. And I'm concerned that currently there's no country on Earth with a plan that is anywhere near meeting this. I'm going to be making the case for a paradigm change in the way we do business. A change from a paradigm of sustainability to a regenerative paradigm. The architect Bill Reed captures the problems of sustainability with this diagram, which shows different levels of environmental achievement. And at the lowest level is conventional practice, or one step better than breaking the law. Above that is relative improvement. That's the realm of most CSR reports and buildings designed with green rating systems like LEED. And then above that is 100% sustainable which has been characterized as 100% less bad. And that's the problem with sustainability. Too often, it has simply been an exercise in mitigating negatives. And the framing implies that the most we can aspire to is neutrality. Anything less than neutral is just part of a degenerative downward cycle. Sustainability has been a disaster. We urgently need to move on to a paradigm that optimizes positives, a paradigm that delivers radical increases in resource efficiency, a paradigm of regenerative design. I'm convinced that there is no better source of ideas to flourish in this new realm than biomimicry, which involves learning from biology. And I'll give you a few examples of this. Currently, concrete manufacturing accounts for roughly 8% of global carbon emissions. The closest thing to concrete in biology is coral reefs. So they are large-scale mineral structures. And it's worth looking at the difference between the way concrete is made and coral. Concrete releases about a ton of CO2 for every ton of concrete, whereas coral grows by taking carbon out of the atmosphere. We could learn to do the same, making materials by taking carbon out of the atmosphere. And this is the essence of biomimicry. It's looking at how nature has solved equivalent challenges to the ones that we face. Another good example is glass manufacturing. So the science writer Janine Benyus, and champion of biomimicry, uh, describes the, the way that humans manufacture things as having a sort of heat, beat, and treat mentality. So we tend to use a lot of energy to excavate stuff from the ground, more energy to process it and form it, uh, to make our materials. But if you look at the way that nature makes glass, this glass sponge has evolved to make glass fiber with higher optical quality at ambient temperature and pressure with available materials in seawater. So it makes glass with many orders of magnitude less energy, quite possibly 10,000 times less energy than we use. And these are the kind of things we need to learn how to do if we're really to make rapid progress. So some of these ideas, like mastering geomineralization and uh, this kind of uh, glass manufacturing, they are beyond our current technological capabilities. But it's something we, we should really be putting a lot of effort and research into. While those may be beyond our current technological capabilities, there's a huge array of other solutions that we could implement immediately. And that's what I'm going to be talking about now how we can use biomimicry to deliver radical increases in resource efficiency and regenerative benefits. I'm going to talk about a couple of projects. And the first one is called the Biomimetic Office. So this was an opportunity for us to use biomimicry to rethink a very conventional building type. We got to get together a fantastic team that included a biologist. And we looked at all the different functions involved in office design lighting, heating, structure, fire protection, etc., etc. And one of the ones that was likely to drive the architectural form the most was lighting. So we looked with our biologist at how light is gathered and distributed in biology. The first organism we looked at is called a spookfish, 
And the spookfish has amazing mirror-shaped structures in its eyes. And these can focus very low levels of light coming up from the ocean and focus that bioluminescent light onto the, the fish's retina. Another one we looked at is called the stone plant. So this is a, a plant that lives in deserts. And for reasons of thermal stabilization, most of the plant lives below the ground. And then it has what you could call a roof light that allows the light to come down to the basement where the chemical reactions can take place at a very steady temperature. Another one we looked at is the brittle star. So this is a type of starfish that lives as much as 500 meters below the ocean surface, where light levels are incredibly low. It has evolved a covering of near optically perfect lenses on its skin. And those lenses are able to detect very small amounts of light and movement so we can see predators long before they see it. So these three examples, and actually many others that we looked at, encouraged us to think much more creatively and deliberately about how we would bring light into this building. We wanted it to be as far as possible entirely naturally lit, partly to save energy and partly because that's much better for human health. Now looking at the building in section, uh, could someone click on the, the video to start it? It should have started automatically. Great, thank you. So what we found was that it was reasonably easy to get enough light into the top parts of the building. The challenge was how we would get light further down to the lower floors. We looked at the possibility of focusing light into fiber optic tubes and then channeling it around the building. For this, we looked at a rainforest plant called Anthurium waraquinum, which has lenses on its leaves, and somehow those are able to focus diffuse light. So this has become a research project that we're hoping to bring into the next stage of our office design. What we did conclude was that there's a very good case for shaping the building to allow more light to come down into the building. And then learning from the spookfish, we proposed a pair of, of large reflective surfaces in the atrium that would bounce light into those lower floors. And then thinking about what we would do underneath that large scale mirror, we thought this was a great opportunity to design a really dramatic meeting space that uh, could be used for functions and would add value to the building. And if I had more time, I'd love to tell you how we learned from the beautifully delicate structure of bird skulls to design out a lot of the concrete from the building, so it would be uh, using radically less concrete. How we learned from curved shell and leaf forms to design a new glazing system that achieves a 50% saving in glass and a 75% saving in aluminium. And how we even learned from folding beetle wings to design a sun shading system that will let in exactly the right amount of light and convert all surplus light into electricity. So this is how the building looks now after we've completed the commercial feasibility study. You can see the strategic form driven by daylight. And in the middle there, that's the spookfish uh, uh, meeting room, which bounces light into the lower floors. And then this is how the, the atrium will look. One of the engineers involved has predicted that this should be one of the lowest energy office buildings in the world when it's built. And this shows what biomimicry can deliver for buildings. Radically increased resource efficiency and a better working environment. Buildings have been getting generally more energy efficient over the last 20 years. There's one area that's been getting steadily more and more energy consuming, and that is data. So this project is a concept for an ultra-low energy data center. And as I'm sure you know, a lot of the energy involved in data centers is just required to keep them cool. So the first move here was to locate the data center that is somewhere already very cold. In this case, a mountain in Norway that has already been carved out for marble mining. It has about 90 kilometers of tunnels that are all at a steady temperature of about five degrees C. So the design challenge then was how do we draw that free source of cooling through the data blocks in the most efficient way possible? And we looked at branching systems in biology. This is a great example of what's referred to as Murray's law. So that's a mathematical constant that governs branching systems in biology. There's a very constant ratio between the diameters of those vessels. There's a constant angle of branching, and there's a certain finessing to those junctions. So that's an evolved minimum energy solution to how you conduct gases and liquids around an organism. 
And we applied that idea fairly directly. We clustered the data blocks into circles to reduce the number of bends in the pipework. And then we designed that branching system exactly based on Murray's law. We had an opportunity to take this a bit further on a, a tender for a water treatment facility. And this tender was going to be decided partly based on uh, capital cost and partly based on 10 years running cost. Now for an energy intensive piece of infrastructure like this, 10 years running costs is huge. So we thought, well, maybe we could use Murray's law to optimize this system. This is a fairly typical water treatment facility. And you can see that it's very rectilinear and there's a lot of space between the elements. So we devised a little design tool that is based on Murray's law. What you see here is a hypothetical layout. The white circles are pieces of equipment and then you've got a, a branching system of pipework that connects them. What the tool does is it works out the optimum relative positioning and the optimum branching angle. If you look at that number in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see that we came down from a pipe length of 100 to below 64%. Then we went further still and we used a, an, an actual layout. So this is all the right elements in the right sequence for a water treatment facility. This time we combined the figures for length and angle to uh, have a figure of a total equivalent length. And that's a very good measure of the total amount of friction in the system. And with this one, you can see that we came down to well below 40%. So this shows what biomimicry could deliver for industries and um, systems, uh, delivering higher performance with far less energy. The final project I want to talk about is the Sahara Forest Project. I've been working on this for over 10 years. And the idea here was to tackle multiple challenges simultaneously. So rather than trying to tackle climate change separately from water shortages, separately from desertification, we were trying to come up with clever ideas to do all of those. And it might be quite surprising to learn that a lot of the world's deserts were actually vegetated a fairly short time ago. So when Julius Caesar arrived in North Africa, that was a wooded landscape of cedar trees and cypress trees. His armies cut those down to create an intensive farm and started the extractive process of desertification that's continued up to the present day. This project brings together three core technologies, forms of solar energy, a seawater-cooled greenhouse inspired by a fog-basking beetle, and desert revegetation techniques. Now, these three technologies have very interesting synergies between them so that they're much more effective together than they are individually. And one of the most interesting synergies is that the shade created by the mirrors makes it possible to grow a whole range of plants underneath that would not normally grow in deserts because the sun is simply so intense. This is what we could be doing under all the solar panels and solar mirrors around the world, restoring nature on a massive scale. We built a version of this in Qatar in, the, uh, in 2012, and this was opened by the Emir of Qatar during the 2012 climate change talks. This allowed us to test all the elements of the system. There's the seawater cooled greenhouse in the middle, two forms of solar energy, algae for biofuels, desert revegetation. This is on site, and this was it on opening day. We grew cucumbers throughout the Qatar summer with half the amount of fresh water of conventional approaches. And alongside kind of twiddling all the knobs on the technical systems, we had a hunch that this was going to be delivering some kind of regenerative benefit. We had an ecology survey at the start which showed that there was literally nothing there. It was just a bare desert, dry, bone dry desert. This sequence shows what we achieved. So we made a note of mammals, birds, and insects that appeared on the site. And the first things to appear were flies, so nothing particularly interesting there. But then, literally the same day that the first plants came to sight, we had the first birds appearing. A week later, we had the first insects, grasshoppers, and crickets. And then a month later, we had the first butterfly. And we don't know where this butterfly came from, because this was a long way from the nearest significant patch of planting. As the plants got more established, we had other birds, uh, like wagtails and more insects. And then we had the first problematic species, rats, and their numbers were increasing rather rapidly. But still, we were getting more birds and insects, which was nice. 
Uh, then we had mice to contend with as well, but still more birds and insects. Then three days after the algae ponds were filled, we had the first dragonflies. And again, I don't know where they came from. It's quite miraculous. Then we had a visit from a feral cat and the number of rats started going down, which is quite nice. Um, more insects, then a, a visit from a rare bird called a hoopo. Then more birds, rufous-tailed shrikes, other types of wagtail, more insects. And eventually, we had the first indigenous mammal. It's called a jaboa, a little, like a little hopping kangaroo. This was all achieved in eight months on a site 100 meters by 100 meters. This is what regenerative design can deliver. Instead of a downward spiral, this is an upward cycle from barren to abundant. One of the main sources of biomimicry here was looking at ecosystem models and trying to bring technologies together in synergistic clusters. So the green icons are the main bits of technology. They'll be using what we have a lot of, sunlight, seawater, and carbon dioxide, to produce more of what we need. These are all the interconnections between the technologies. So every underutilized resource, we're treating that as an opportunity to add value to the system. Some people look at these kind of diagrams and think, well, that looks hellishly complicated. Well, yes, in a way, but I would argue it's nowhere near as complicated as a real ecosystem where you have thousands of interdependent organisms that are symbiotic and dependent on each other. And we've developed a design tool to make it easier to design these kind of complex systems. So this allows you to put in a technology with its resource flows, connect up those resource flows, Anything that is underutilized, that's a sign that you can add something to the system to create more value. You could then test for resilience. You could chop any one of those links, and if the whole system breaks down, that's an indication you need to add more duplication or buffering to make it more resilient. And then you can uh, click play, and you can see how the system operates. I'm convinced we're going to be seeing more and more examples of these sort of synergistic systems. Here's another example uh, in Denmark. So this brings together solar, wind, biomass, and energy storage, as well as delivering regenerative benefits to uh, fish stocks and creating new habitats. We're also going to see biomimicry delivering major improvements to energy systems. For instance, looking at fish shoaling patterns to optimize the spacing of wind turbines. Looking at plant geometry to optimize the spacing of mirrors, and many more besides. And to conclude, I want to say a few more things about this miraculous organism, the glass sponge, because it captures some absolutely crucial elements of what I've been saying. It demonstrates phenomenal resource efficiency. It demonstrates ultra-low energy manufacturing. It also cultivates symbiotic relationships. Those glass fibers, each of those extends down into the seabed and finishes in a cluster of lenses. That's the image you can see on the bottom right. And those lenses focus light from bioluminescent bacteria and conduct that light up the organism to put on a lighting display to attract food. These are the kind of lessons we need to learn if we're really to make progress on tackling climate breakdown. Delivering solutions with far less energy and no pollution. And this is a transition that we can all be involved with. Transitioning our businesses, our buildings, and cities to function regeneratively. Drawing on the best sources of solutions there's ever been. 3.8 billion years of research and development. That's what we have in biology. This phenomenal period of refinement, of e evolution. 3.8 billion years of miraculous solutions, illuminated by previously unparalleled scientific knowledge, facilitated by previously unimaginable design tools. We have never had such an opportunity to rethink and devise solutions fit for the next billion years. Thank you.